se saca samo ovak tako cola. I los pakaros komen nel i ptici budu pitati jeju. I les oiseaux sont nourriront i vogli vedi ne desu. Y los niños de los del mundo comerán de él. Y si es que mira puedo cuchete yo. Y los hombres del mundo han oído que quiero de ver ver no te hace. El mundo llorará. Y ya 
Y los niños morarán. Palestine. There are many outrages happening in the world today, and this one is one that could be solved by a decision to abolish nuclear weapons, to bury them, to get, a, give, get away with them. It's not as difficult as, as climate change or even as racism, which we have to work on. But nuclear weapons, it's a decision by government and it can be, they can be uh, ended by government. So I'd like to invite Maho, who is here, who, uh, where is she? Who is, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, but I got Yeah, there she is. Maho has uh, worked on the peace boat from the Japanese student uh, movement. They have a wonderful cruise ship that goes around the world and stops and talks peace in every at every port. And she's been involved with that and. Uh, your mother is Japanese, and you're going to say a few words. Thank you. Thank you, Roman. Uh, my name is Maho. I'm from Japan, and I live in Burlington. And I just wanted to say a few words, highlighting that today there are three countries joined and ratified the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. And that makes it a ratification of 43 countries. That means we have seven more countries to go before the treaty will enter into force. And that treaty is one very powerful, uh, legally binding instrument that we have to prohibit nuclear weapons. And those, um, that's, that's some remarkable steps that we're making. That's where the world is heading. And I also want to highlight that uh, Hibakusha, the atomic bomb survivors, has been a big part of the adoption of the treaty. Um, they, they have been dedicating their lives to, uh, to speak out and make sure that no one will suffer through what they did. The average age of Hibakusha is now over 82. Um, I just wanted to introduce you quickly the amazing leader, uh, inspiring leader from Nagasaki, uh, Terumi Tanaka. He's 88 years old this year, and he lost five of his family members. And he says that we, the Hibakushas, the atomic bomb survivors, have been long time calling for uh, the um, inhumane nuclear weapons cannot coexist with the humanity. And I think what Hibakusha want to see is their voices to continue and not an increase in the defense budget or the resuming of nuclear testing. So I just would like to call for no more Hibakusha. Thank you. So I'm just gonna say a brief speech. 
As we remember the horrors of nuclear war, we need to rededicate ourselves to making sure that it never happens again. We live in a world where today North Korea now has 20 nuclear bombs. You have potential hotspots, Israel, Iran, India, Pakistan, India, China, and where the most nukes are, the US and Russia. Today, President Trump is breaking treaties and we are entering a new arms race. Uh, and, and what's even worse, they're starting a space force, which means you may have nuclear weapons very close over our heads in the next year or two. I mean, this is really dangerous. Here in Vermont, we now have a squadron of F-32 jets. The Pentagon has decided to arm some of them with nuclear weapons. These same, same kind of planes are being deployed near Russia in Poland and in Turkey and around Russia with, with a first strike capability. Some people here say, well, the F-35s won't have nuclear weapons, but it's all top secret. And if you trust the military, they had nuclear weapons here before and they will do whatever they need to do. So for the sake of humanity, we need to redouble our efforts to disarm this world. The Bulletin of Atomic Scientists now says we are 100 seconds from Armageddon, the closest ever since they started the Doomsday Clock in 1945. Stopping the F-35s is what we can do locally, defunding the military, and de dis disarming is what we need to do next. Thank you. Sponsored by the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. You can see our banner here. This is the 100th anniversary of suffrage this year. We want to thank Red Republicans for coming all the way down here. so that the cranes can actually fly as they do when they're in Glover. So let's reorganize ourselves right over there at the head of college and we zoom down.
It's very hard to sing loud with a mask on, I'm noticing. <laughs> it's wonderful to have all of you here. Thank you for coming. I'm Rachel Siegel. I use she, her pronouns, and I work at the Peace and Justice Center. I want to thank the folks who organized the march down here. I'm very excited that Tycho Drummers and Bread and Puppet were able to be a part of it. So thank you all. Um, yeah. So I, the, one of the handouts that we have notes that 75 years ago today when we dropped the atom bomb on Hiroshima, 90% of the people in the city were killed on contact. And I was thinking about Burlington, which is a little over 40,000. But if we think of it as 40,000 people, 90% Thirty-six thousand, I think. Thirty-six thousand on the spot, and then thousands more in the days to come, and illness for generations and trauma to live with. But for me, imagining the thirty-six thousand on the spot here in Burlington really made it real for me in another way. So I think we'll go to another song, unless somebody wants to come and share any thoughts. I could also bring the mic to you, and I can sanitize it in between uses. If somebody wants to speak and doesn't want to come down here, we can accommodate that. Good afternoon. My name is John Ruhr. I'm a longtime member of Physicians for Social Responsibility and have been looking at nuclear war and nuclear weapons since Ronald Reagan came into office in 1980 saying we could win a nuclear war. There's just two points I want to make today. The first is the danger of this is as great as it has ever been. The danger of having a nuclear conflagration of some time, some kind for lots of reasons that you only have to read the newspapers to learn. China, a full nuclear power, and the United States are playing war games against each other in the South China Sea even as we speak. Russia and American relations are as low as they've ever been. Those two countries possess 92% of the world's nuclear weapons, including 800 weapons each that are on hair trigger alert that if launched in the next hour, would surprise no historian looking back. They could only say they knew that was coming, just like we knew this pandemic was coming and did nothing about it. The nuclear weapons there, they're still in hair trigger alert. Look at Iran, a war with Iran. If you want to see what, how that could start, uh, the Vermont International Film Festival is actually uh, linked to a movie called Threads that shows what a nuclear war all out would have looked like in 1984. That movie is the most realistic nuclear war film ever made. If you want to see it, I recommend you go to their website, look online, and we'll have a discussion about it tomorrow night. But it just so happens that that movie starts with showing all the families that are going to be affected by the war and killed by the war. But in the background, the news is playing about how the Russians and the United States are intervening in Iran eerily familiar. Then there's North Korea that now has nuclear weapons with the United States and it threatening each other constantly. There are many other scenarios. India and Pakistan both have about 300 nuclear weapons. It's been well studied. If they have their own war just localized to their region, the amount of soot from all the fires that would ensue would darken the skies enough around the world to lower the temperature three or four times what we're worried about it raising in the next 50 years would happen in a couple of weeks. Utter climate disaster and mass starvation, even with a very limited nuclear war. And if they all go off, our civilization is done for. So we really need to pay a lot more attention to this than we are now. 
The second thing is how much hope we actually have. Back in 1980, there were 70,000 nuclear weapons in the world. Now there's fewer than 14,000. That only happened because people worked very hard to convince their political leaders to back the nuclear freeze and put a million people in the streets of New York City in 1982, demanding that these weapons be frozen and then reduced. And we succeeded. Ronald Reagan became the greatest disarmament president in history. And all that was in place and decreasing from that 70,000 to now 13,500 until the Obama administration and this generation forgot how bad nuclear war can be. And now there's a buildup. All nine of the states that have nuclear weapons are spending lots and lots of money to the, in the world, probably $100 billion a year to modernize weapons. And part of that modernization is making them more accurate and smaller so they're actually usable. If you all read about the explosion in Beirut that was out far enough on the dock that it didn't kill that many people, 135, but 5,000 injured. Had that been in the center of the city, it would have been 5,000 or 6,000 killed and, and 100,000 injured. They were lucky. But that size explosion I calculated the other day is really on the small end of our nuclear weapons now. We actually have nuclear weapons that are smaller than that. And that makes war planners think they're usable. The problem is if they use a few, there's radiation effects that Lebanon doesn't have to worry about, huge radiation effects that are both short-term and long-term. But also, there are too many big nuclear weapons left. Even though we've gotten rid of 85%, there's enough to really destroy civilization and all human civilization as we know it. There will probably be a lot of miserable people surviving, but nothing that you'd want a world to be. The point is, the danger is greater than most people realize, and we've got to get that word out about that. And secondly, we have a lot more power than we think we do to stop it. We have such a microcosm of this F-35 thing. And what a great example of how people flying this plane and using this plane are kidding themselves. The Defense Secretary and the Nuclear Posture Review says the F-35 is a nuclear-capable bomber. It's the only new nu nuclear weapons delivery system and the Guard can flatly tell you they're not going to use it. It's not set to use those nuclear weapons now, but it could be six months from now or a year from now. But in the belief that it's good for the economy and we love having our sons have such exciting jobs flying these planes and all the patriotic hoopla, they're kidding themselves or downright lying about how that F-35 could be the beginning of the end with a nuclear holocaust. In the movie Threads I mentioned, you'll see F-4s, the old F-4 Phantoms, the old people here will all remember what they look like because they flew Vietnam. You see them constantly taking off in the background before the Holocaust begins. That would be an F-35 in this day and age. So thank you for coming down here, but please, as you leave here, get online. There are countless organizations doing good work, but the, the, the things to pay attention to are the bank back from the brink resolutions, which says we can immediately reduce the danger without any cost to anybody by taking immediately away the president's authority to start a nuclear war on his own, which he can do right now, uh, taking the, the weapons off hair trigger alert, stop building new nuclear weapons to save a pile of money that we need for climate change problems, pollution, and, and the pandemic, and then negotiate a treaty, which actually already exists, that's close to coming into force, to prohibit nuclear weapons worldwide. If we do these things, we can bring ourselves back from the brink very carefully. So please get on to nuclearban.com or preventnuclearwar.org and learn about these things and take them to City Hall. The City of Burlington, the City of South Burlington, the City of Winooski has passed back from the brink resolutions asking the federal government to do these things with letters sent to the president. But three cities is nothing compared to the, what, 170 cities we had in the 1980s that all passed freeze resolutions to freeze nuclear weapons. We need the activism. You have the power. Please join us to do it. Thank you. Let's sing If I Had a Hammer.
I'm Wendy Ko. Um, and uh, I was in New York City on June 12, 1982. I organized the Vermont contingent. Um, so I wrote a, a letter to Senator Pat Leahy because he was just on uh, VPR. They were playing his interview with John Lewis and Leahy was going on about how bad racism is and everything. And then it dawned on me because I live in the old North End and every day I get to listen to the F-35 flying over that Leahy went against the Pentagon, put the F-35 here and where in all of Lily White, Vermont, does it fly over the most densely populated with people of color part of Vermont, Winooski and the old north end of Burlington? And that's racism. And that's what I wrote him. It was a really short letter, but that's what I wrote him. And he keeps continuing to ignore those of us who complain about the F-35. But um, anyway, I just... Just wanted to share that. Anybody who wants to write him a letter and explain to him that his nice, friendly talks with John Lewis, that John Lewis wouldn't have put the F-35 right next to the most colorful part of all of Vermont. So Wendy's words just also reminded me about uh, something I wanted to name, which is the need for intersectionality in this work. That a lot of the anti-war work that was really building a lot through the 60s and 70s and into the 80s really started to dwindle as other identity-based activism started rising. And I think the things are all very obviously connected, but I think that we don't always make that connection blatant in our anti-war work. And I think that until we're able to do that more clearly, we're gonna have a hard time pulling more people into the anti-war movement. So I encourage everybody to think deeply about things like what Wendy just said, and about where, you know, where are the bombs being made? Where are the minerals being extracted from the ground and who's being impacted by that? Where have the bombs been tested and who's being impacted by that? I'm thinking about how this song starts. It's a round, if we get that far. And there's basically three lines, and you sing each one twice. So it's A, A, B, B, C, C. The first line is, we're going, we're gonna rise up, rise up till it's one. So just maybe say the words one time, we're gonna rise up, rise up till it's one. We're gonna rise up, rise up till it's one. And it goes, we're gonna rise up, rise up till it's one. We're gonna rise up, rise up till it's one. One more time. We're gonna rise up, rise up till it's one. Good, the second line is, when the people rise up, the powers go down. So just say it. When the people rise up, the powers go down. And the tune is, when the people rise up, the powers go down. And the second time it's slightly different, it goes, when the people rise up, the powers go down. So let's try that two times through. When the people rise up, the powers go down. When the people rise up, the powers go down. And then the third line, um, they try to stop us, but we keep coming back. They try to stop us, but we keep coming back. They try to stop us, but we keep coming back all together. We try, they try to stop us, but we keep coming back. One more time. They try to stop us, but we keep coming back. Okay, so we're gonna sing. 
it all the way through each line twice. And we'll just keep going for a while. And if people start to feel brave, you can branch off. You could just sing one line the entire time, or you can rotate through all three. Okay. We're gonna rise up, rise up till it's one. We're gonna rise up, rise up till it's one. When the people rise up, the powers go down. When the people rise up, the powers go down. They try to stop us, but we keep coming back. They try to stop us, but we keep coming back. We're gonna rise up. We're gonna rise up, rise up till it's one. We're gonna rise up, rise up till it's one. When the people rise up, the powers go down. When the people rise up, the powers go down. They try to stop us, but we keep coming back. They try to stop us, but we keep coming back. So I'm gonna sing just the first line for a long time. And then people can keep singing just the first line if they want, but then I'll also add in the second line. What? Oh, sorry. We're gonna rise up, rise up till it's one. We're gonna rise up. Anybody else who wants to come and share some thoughts? Hi, uh, my name is Leslie. Can you hear me okay? Hi, can you hear me now? Yeah. I'd like to read an account from, that was written from a, by a survivor of Hiroshima, Toyomi Hashimoto. August 6, 1945, Hiroshima. 
possibly the darkest day in a dark decade. Three days later, the United States drops a second bomb on the city of Nagasaki. Toyomo Hashimoto remembers that day. Though at each anniversary, the skies over our city are blue and peaceful, the memory of that day in 1945 still troubles my body and soul. In spite of the wartime conditions, my husband and our little son and I lived a happy life. On the morning of August 9th, 1945, I walked to the gate to see my husband off to work. My three-year-old son, Takashi, went out to play. I was alone in the house when in the distance I heard an approaching airplane. Japanese, I wondered. I stepped outside to see my son running to me, calling, airplane, airplane. The moment we re-entered the house, there was a blinding flash followed by a tremendous explosion. The roof of the house caved in, pinning us under a mountain of debris. Hours passed. Then I heard my son crying softly and calling for mother and father. He was alive. I tried to reach for him, but a huge beam immobilized me. I could not break free, though I screamed for help. No one came. Soon I heard voices calling names of neighbors. My son was bravely trying to crawl from under a heap of clay that had been one of the walls. When he turned and faced me, I saw that his right eye was obliterated with blood. Once again, I tried to move, but the beam would not budge. I screamed so loud and long that I must have lost my voice. I called to the people I could see scurrying about, but they did not hear me. No one answered until the lady next door finally pulled my son, my son out of the wreckage. I suddenly became aware of a sharp pain in my breast, left hand, and stomach. As I tried to crawl out, I saw that a huge nail was stuck in my stomach. Fire! Fire! I could hear people shouting around me. It was either break free or burn to death. With a violent wrench, I pulled myself from under the beam. In doing so, I ripped the flesh of my stomach and blood spurted from an agonizing gash in my body. I was at last out of the ruined house. Still, my son was nowhere to be seen. Perhaps the kind lady next door had led him to safety. I had to search for him, but I could only limp slowly because of the pain in my stomach. As I crept slowly along, People more seriously injured than I clutched at my feet and pleaded for help and water. I heard loud voices shouting, leave the old people, help the children first. All I could do was to promise to come back with water if it was possible. Thank heaven you're alive, I heard a familiar voice saying and turning with intense happiness, I saw my husband who was holding our son in his arms. We climbed to the top of a hill together, walking among countless corpses. On the hilltop, a kind man gave us bedsheets, candles, sugar, and other useful things. At once, we began to try to do something for Takashi, who had lost consciousness. After a while, as we dripped sugar water into his mouth, he awakened. He had already lost the sight of his right eye. Myriad slivers of glass were embedded in his head, face, body, arms, and legs. An air raid alarm, still in effect, prohibited lighting candles. In the pitch darkness, my husband and I picked out as many pieces of glass from his body as we could find. So full of life and energy until that moment, and now my son, blind in one eye, and covered with blood and dirt. Still, he bore everything bravely and only asked, am I being a good boy?
So I think I had a request that we do, we shall overcome next. And if there's any actual singers or musicians here who would rather lead, <laughs> be happy to hand this roll off. I got it by default. We shall overcome, we shall overcome, we shall overcome someday. Oh, deep in my heart, I So if you've got your song sheet, we're going to do Imagine by John Lennon. <laughs> <laughs> 